Hello and welcome to Daily Prayer today for uh, December 7th, 2021. Glad that you are with me today. Today is Panama Mother's Day. Pretend to be a time traveler day, which sounds like a lot of fun. National Brownie Day and the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, along with other several things. Oh, no, just Bodhi Day. That's the only other one. As far as National Today is concerned, at least. Let us join together in prayer. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into song, and all the trees of the forest shall clap their hands. For behold, our Lord and ruler is coming to reign forever. Alleluia. Come, Lord Jesus. Our first psalm for today is Psalm 50. Listen for God's word for you. The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and does not keep silence. Before God is a devouring fire and a mighty tempest all around God. God calls to the heavens above and to the earth that God may judge God's people. Gather to me, my faithful ones, who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare God's righteousness, for God, God's self, is judge. Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your folds, for every wild animal of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the air, and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and all that is in it is mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving, and pay your vows to the Most High. Call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to recite my statutes, or take my covenant on your lips? For you hate discipline, and you cast my words before you, behind you, excuse me. You make friends with a thief when you see one, and you keep company with adulterers. You give your mouth free rein for evil, and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your kin. You slander your own mother's child. These things you have done, and I have been silent. You thought I was one just like yourself, but now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. Mark this, then, you who forget God, or I will tear you apart and there will be no one to deliver. Those who bring thanksgiving as their sacrifice honor me. To those who go the right way, I will show the salvation of God. From Psalm 147, verses 1 through 11. Praise the Lord! How good it is to sing praises to our God! For God is gracious, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. God gathers the outcasts of Israel. God heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. God determines the number of the stars. God gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. God's understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. God casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. God covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, makes grass grow on the hills. God gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. God's delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor God's pleasure in the speed of a runner, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear God and those who hope in God's steadfast love. Now for our thanksgiving for baptism. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise.
God of all glory, we give you thanks that through the gift of baptism, we have been crucified with Christ and united with God, with him in resurrection. By the power of your Holy Spirit, let our lives proclaim the good news that we are dead to sin and alive to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our readings for today are right there. Amos chapter 8, verses 1 through 14. Listen for God's word to speak to you. This is what the Lord God showed me, a basket of summer fruit. God said, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people, Israel. I will never again pass them by. The songs of the temple shall become wailings in that day. The dead bodies shall be many, says the Lord God. Cast out in every place. Be silent. Hear this, then you that trample on the needy and bring to ruin the poor of the land, saying, When will the new moon be over, so that we may sell grain and the Sabbath, so that we may offer wheat for sale? We will make the ephah small and the shekel great, and practice deceit with false balances, buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, and selling the sweepings of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Shall not the land tremble on this account, and every one mourn who lives in it, and all of it rise like the Nile, and be tossed about and sink again like the Nile of Egypt? On that day, says the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on all loins and baldness on every head. I will make it like the morning for an only sun and the end of it like a bitter day. The time is surely coming, says the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or of thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. In that day, the beautiful young women and the young men shall faint for thirst. Those who swear by Ashima of Samaria and say, As your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Beersheba lives, they shall fall and never rise again. From Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 through 2 7. When I saw him, the Son of Man, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, and the living one. I was dead, and see, I am alive forever and ever, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. Now write what you have seen, what is, and what is to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. I know that you, you cannot tolerate evildoers. You have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them to be false. I also know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for the sake of my name, and that you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then from what you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this is to your credit. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. 
To everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. From Matthew 23, verses 1 through 12. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it. But do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others. But they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They love to have the places of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues, and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces, and to have people call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all students. And call no one your father on earth, for you have one father the one in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. All who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Great stuff today. All right. So let's talk about um, Amos first. So. Um, Amos has this uh, fruit of, or this bowl of summer fruit. Um, and God says, well, what do you see here? He says, it's a s- bowl of summer fruit, right? What does that mean? Again, we have this image that we have throughout scripture of, of these good things being fruit. So here's the fruit that God sees when God looks here at Israel and King Jeroboam, and, and the things that are going on. This summer fruit is rotten. Um, because of this, God says, the end has come to my people Israel. I will never pass them by. The songs of the temple shall become wailing in that day. The dead bodies shall be many, cast out in every place, be silent. Why? Hear this, you that trample on the needy and bring to ruin the poor of the land, saying, When will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain and the Sabbath, so that we may offer wheat for sale? We will make the ephah small and the shekel great and practice deceit with false balances, buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and selling the sweepings of the wheat. For Amos, it's all about economic disparity completely why is there un why is there such unrighteousness why is there such turmoil in the land why is god sending destruction because those who have much are mistreating those who have little they he uses this image right that they are trampling the needy They are bringing to ruin the poor of the land. How are they doing this? They ask questions like, when will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain and the Sabbath so that we may offer wheat for sale? So traditionally, (laughs) and you know, it's kind of like blue laws. This is where this comes from. There was a time, Saturday, the Sabbath for the Jewish people, you do not sell anything. You just don't sell. Also on the new moon. So when there is no light on the moon, every new moon there would be this festival and it'd be a Sabbath to the Lord. This is for everyone to enjoy. You're not supposed to sell things on that day. So the rich are saying, hey, when is this stupid thing over? When are we done with this festival? When are we done with Sabbath so I can get back to selling stuff? That doesn't sound familiar at all, does it? I don't know. Let's think about that. They also say that they will make the ephah small and the shekel great. So an ephah is a unit of measurement to measure out, you know, like on on a scale, how much grain there is. So if the ephah is small, there's actually less, um, less grain that is being sold for the same amount. And we'll make the... Um, 
shekel great. A shekel was a coin. And so they're going to inflate that so it doesn't go as far so that you're actually spending more for less. Gosh, this is sounding really familiar, right? They buy the poor for silver. Um, so they are, are just grabbing up those who have little and basically using them as indentured servants so that they are forced to work for them for silver, not even that much, right? A little bit. Um, and they are selling just the, the leftovers, the sweepings of the wheat. Gosh, this is sounding real familiar. I don't know. What do you think? We're, we're going through some inflation right now, right? And there are some who say inflation is crazy and, you know, like there's just, it's going rampant and we should continue on with that almost, right? There are some who say, oh, it's not that bad. It's no problem. You know who gets hurt by inflation? It's not the people who have a decent amount who are comfortable. It's the people who are on the edge. We also look at where, where is this inflation coming from? And there are reports that are coming out that are saying that within these industries, right, they're raising up in, uh, prices because of inflation. And, and primarily the inflation that we are um, undergoing right now is supply and demand. There are, there are issues with supply. And so therefore the demand goes up. All of a sudden people are not locked away at home and now they're out and trying to buy things. It's the, the holiday season. Um, that is raising up the prices, but then one company will raise the prices and then another says, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. We'll raise the prices too. And we'll raise it a little bit more. And then these ones raise a little bit more. And so these monopolies are starting to raise the prices more and more and more. We're seeing things like, you know, the, the cost of oil goes up and the, you know, we all know the gas prices rise. The cost of oil goes back down again and it goes down a little bit, but not nearly as much. And yet, all companies have really high profits, and so do their uh, investors. There's lots of stuff going on here that Amos, or yeah, Amos might recognize. So, what is the call? Repent. The call is come back, right? The call is, don't take it out on the poor. Stand up for the poor. See what's going on. See where you can make a difference. What God is saying to the people of Israel is kind of like, almost like a parent, you know. You've got... <laughs> You should be mourning this. You should be sad about the state of affairs. And if you're not, I'm going to make you sad. Um, there is going to be some punishment. There's going to be some correction. The destruction of Israel is going to be the reason for their grief. It's going to be the reason for their mourning, for their lamentation. But the reason should be what they are doing. The reason should be how they are treating those who are on the margins. But since they're not doing that, they're going to lose that. They're going to lose their ability to afflict the poor, and they themselves are going to become poor. Um, these are, this is hard, hard words to hear. It was hard words for the people of Israel, and it's hard for us to hear these same words and recognize ourselves, recognize our systems, our economic systems, and the challenges of, of what Israel was facing. In the same way, we have great economic prosperity. We, folks, there, there's a lot of money out there, right? But the problem is the disparity, right? There are folks who have a lot and can continue to gain what they have, and the folks who don't have much are being priced out of the market. 
This is not just a problem of economics, says Amos. This is a problem of righteousness. This is a problem of our morality. This is a problem of our ethics. We can't just let it be because this is the way the system is. Anyways, Revelation. Um, so the Son of Man comes to John and says, okay, I'm, I'm going to give you this revelation. I'm going to give you these words for these, particularly these seven churches in Asia and describes them as these um, seven golden lampstands. These would uh, are reminiscent. I think it's the uh, an allusion to these lampstands that stood in the temple or the tabernacle and were lit very much like the candles we have at the at the front of the sanctuary for worship, that they are signifying the light of God coming into the world, right? Jesus appears here with these seven lampstands, and they signify these seven churches who are lights in the world. And so now, Jesus, the Son of Man, is going to address each of these churches. So we have this first one in Ephesus. And as we look at these, um, I had a friend of mine who did this really interesting study looking at each of them as sort of modes of being church, ways that we are churches. There are good things and there are bad things. Some of these churches have way more good things than they have bad things. There's a few of them that have way more bad things than they have good things. So let's look at Ephesus. So to Ephesus writes, um, hey, I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, the things that you do. You cannot tolerate evildoers. That's great. Um, you've tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not actually apostles. You have found them to be false. I know that you're enduring patiently and bearing for the sake of my name and that you have not grown weary. Great, right? Good job. You are doing a good job. You're doing good things. You've, you've got, you know, you, you test those who are, are claiming incorrectly that they are apostles, those sort of sent to, to, to proclaim the gospel and to, to build up the church, um, but they're not actually, that's not what they're doing. Um, you've patiently endured. You're, you're continuing on. This is good stuff that you are doing, right? However, it's not all good news. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned your love at the first. Remember, then, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works that you did at first. If not, just like in Amos, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. So this is a church that maybe is, is more established. They are doing the work. They have been doing the work. Um, they are continuing to, to proclaim. They're continuing to worship. They are continuing to do all the things that they're supposed to be doing as a church. Sorry, I have to reset my slides. But they have lost their passion. They're just doing it. It's perfunctory. It's, it's just out of obligation that they continue to gather and worship. But they don't. there's no spirit in it. There's no love. There's no joy. There's no peace. They're just doing it. They've lost the love that they had at first. Because of this, it doesn't really matter. Again, very much like Amos. It doesn't matter that you gather and do all this worship and do all these good things because your heart is not in it. There's, there's nothing behind it. You're just doing it. So sure, it's, it's better than doing the opposite. You're not actively doing evil, maybe unlike uh, Israel with, with um, Amos. But you're, you're not showing love in the things that you're doing. So you need to repent. You need to come back. Come back to that first love, that joy in the spirit that you had once. At, at one time, you had this joy in the spirit. Come back to that, right? That's what he says. And he finally says, to your credit, you also hate the work of the Nic Nic Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Um, so the Nicolaitans were probably... I believe they were a what we call a Gnostic group. 
where they kind of believed weird stuff. Um, they had all these sort of, I don't know, conspiracy theory kind of stuff about, you know, Jesus was the first creation of creation and and the devil is his brother and the angels were like like all of this kind of weird stuff that they kind of all bring this all together we look at it and we go that's that's weird that doesn't make sense and they get their name from uh gnostic means secret and so it was very much this sort of like secret society cult kind of things where they would not let you know all the crazy stuff that they believed until you came in and kind of were invested in the community and then we're, we're going to let you in on the, the secrets of, of these things, right? Um, and uh, John, at least, really does not like the Nicolaitans. He, the Nicolaitans come up several times throughout these letters. So that's the sort of letter to the church in Ephesus from uh, the Revelation. Then we have from Matthew, uh, Jesus now the the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the priests have just they're they've given up they're they're going to leave him alone outwardly at least and so he tells all the people hey you know what these scribes these Pharisees these people in authority they have the seed of Moses they have the responsibility of preaching the the law so you should listen to them, right? There's, there's a reason that they have this. There's this role that they are supposed to be fulfilling. Go ahead and do what they tell you to do. That's, I'm not saying to not do the things that they tell you to do, but here's the, here's the difference. Don't do what they do, because that's a different thing. Like the church in Ephesus, like the people of Israel, their hearts are not in the right place. And so they build up these big, heavy burdens to lay on other people's backs. They do all their good deeds so that they will be seen by others and that they'll be recognized. And they love to, to have that sort of moral authority and to, be, to walk around and be recognized by people. That's all they care about. They don't actually care about God. They don't actually care about righteousness. They don't actually care about justice. So listen to what they're saying, because they're saying the words of God. But don't do what they're doing. Hypoc hypocrisy is not a new thing in the church, in the religious world. Partially because it's so easy to do it. It's so easy to say the right words and not actually do the right things. The um, answer to that is self-reflection and humility. All of us, whether in, we're in positions of authority or whether we're not, need to be reflecting on our own words and our own actions. We need to make sure that we're listening to, you know, maybe the words of Amos. We're listening to the words of uh, Revelation. We're hearing. How am I not doing what I'm saying that I should be doing? How am I not living up to this? Now, this, is not, this is, should not be a guilt thing. God has already accepted us, right? We already have salvation through Jesus Christ. But in light of that grace, we can look at ourselves and say, you know what? I don't have the same love that I used to have for God. My passion has gone away. What do I need to do? How do I need to go back to that first love? How do I need to, to love God more? How am I actually acting towards those who have less than I do? How am I participating in these systems of oppression? How am I participating in these systems that keep those who have little down and raise up those who accumulate more and more? How am I participating in that? Even just tacitly, how am I not saying something against it? How am I a part of this system? How am I saying with my words what we should be doing, but actually not doing the things that I'm saying? How am I saying things differently through the way that I act towards others? Or the little side comments that I make, might make. 
And if we are actually self-reflective, if we are actually looking at ourselves clearly with humility, if we are actually looking at the log in our eye and working on taking that out before we focus on the speck of someone else, if we are putting that burden on ourselves, taking it on ourselves, understanding our own self and not putting burdens on others, then we're going a long way. But it's a constant thing. <laughs> this is not a one and done thing. This is discipleship. This is taking up our cross every day, taking up our death, taking up our irrelevance, taking up our dying to self every day. Not, oh, I did that once. I, I self-reflected once and I, I found out a lot of, of things and then I didn't do anything about them and I, now I'm better, right? It has to be a constant, constant work. A constant focus on you know on ourselves in a not selfish way as a way where we really honestly look at how we are seasons like advent seasons like lent are here for us that the part of the purpose is that self-reflection to understand who we are how we are how do we deal with others how do we do the things that we are called to do and to honestly reflect and say, you know what? I haven't done as, as good as I should have done. But I'm going to try to do better. And so each day we try and try to do better. So that was, that was a whole sermon that I was not expecting, but that's okay. That's great. All right, let's go ahead and join together in prayer. Satisfy us with your love in the morning, and we will live this day in joy and praise. Mighty God of mercy, we thank you for the resurrection dawn, bringing the glory of our risen Lord, who makes every day new. Especially we thank you for the mission and ministry of the church. Every service that proclaims your love. The people and relationships that sustain us. Our calling to daily discipleship. Signs of new life and hope. People of God, for what else do we give thanks? We give thanks for the ability to self-reflect. To understand how we have fallen short of the glory of God. And the grace to know that that knowledge does not undo us. That God loves us exactly who we are and desires us to be righteous and, and to do better. Merciful God of might, renew this weary world, heal the hurts of all your children, and bring about your peace for all in Christ Jesus, the living Lord. Especially we pray for the church of Jesus Christ in every land, the stewardship and healing of creation, friends and family members, Neighbors in special need. All who serve your mission in the world. People of God, for what else do we pray? We pray for Julie, who is recovering from having some kidney stones. For Freddie, who is recovering from a liver stent. For Ashley, who is recovering from kidney stone removal. For an unspoken request. For all the many other prayers that we have on our hearts and our minds. God of all wisdom, our heart yearns for the warmth of your love, and our minds search for the light of your word. Increase our longing for Christ our Savior, and strengthen us to grow in love, that at the dawn of his coming, we may rejoice in his presence and welcome the light of his truth. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now let us continue to pray using the words that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now the grace of God be with us all, now and always. Amen. Bless the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Thank you so much for joining me today for daily prayer. Join me tomorrow for some more. Like this video, share it with someone else. Click on the subscription and the notification button, as well as going to our website, johncalvinchurch.org, for more information. Go to our Facebook and our Instagram accounts because we have a daily devotion there for Advent and Christmas. Check it out. See what's going on. Our liturgy today came from the Book of Common Worship, the Presbyterian Church USA 2018 edition, and our readings came from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. Thank you for joining me. And by the way, it is not December 7th. It is December 8th. I just didn't update the slide. So when you see 7 and the next slide, just remember that it's the 8th, and hopefully don't get too confused. 